birthday. And I think we're almost ready to begin. So hello everyone and welcome to PMP Live. I'm Leah, I'm a bookseller of Politics of Prose and I truly have the honor of being your host today. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in in this virtual format, which allows us to continue to bring these awesome authors and their cool books to readers like you. So I'm so excited to welcome our very special guest today, Steve Scheinkin, as we celebrate the release of his newest book, Fallout, Spies, Super Bombs, and the Ultimate Cold War Showdown. If you haven't grabbed your copy already, you can click on the link that will drop in the chat box to get your own copies. And there include a awesome book plate while supplies last. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank <laughs> and, you. And also, if you have a question for our guest today, um, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there at the end of our chat. Steve will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also vote on the ones that you like and really want answered by clicking the thumbs up button. And as always, remember that this is a creative safe space and we ask that friends be respectful of one another in their questions and comments. Also teachers, if you're sharing your screen today, welcome to include the student's first name, grade and the school you're attending so we can give students a proper shout out. So thank you so much friends, classrooms for joining us. And I think now um, for the event you're all waiting for, it is my honor to introduce award-winning author, Master nonfiction storyteller, mm -hmm. Steve Scheinkin. From Notorious Benedict Arnold's The Port Chicago 50 to Bomb and The Most Dangerous, Scheinkin continues to deliver fast-paced and twisting histories for young readers. His work has received numerous honors, including a Newbery Honor, the Boston Globe Horn Book Awards, the Siebert, and three-time National Book Award finals. And that's just naming a few. So today it is such a treat that we're celebrating the release of his newest book, Fallout. So without further ado, let's pass it over to Steve. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you to Politics and Prose for making this all happen. This is really cool to talk about my brand new book. It's just been out a little over almost two weeks now, Fallout. And it's a really good example of what I try to do when I'm writing nonfiction, which is to make it really fast paced and fun to read. So I'm going to take a little time to tell you about the book and my writing process and then leave lots of time for questions. So the first thing I'm going to try to do, I say try because sharing my screen should work, right? I think it's going to work. Okay. So how's that look? Leah, can you see that? Somebody? I'm assuming you can see a screen of, uh, uh, yes, of covers right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, this is a good example of what I try to do. I mean, these are the last eight books that I've written, and they're all over the place in terms of time and place in American history. But there's a theme, which is that they're fast-paced kind of thrillers, adventure stories. And it's a great job to have, but it's not something that I ever set out to do. So very first thing I want to do is kind of describe how I got into it and, and then tell you a little bit about the books, especially Fallout. So let me go back in time. How do you get a job that you never meant to have? I always wanted to be a writer from back in these days. Now here's where I wish I, wish I could really see you guys because I know you'd be admiring the hair in this picture of me and my brother when we were, I was 13, he's 10 or 11, and we decided to be writing partners and we were going to make movies together. And in a very strange way that led directly, or I should say indirectly to the job that I have now because we just dedicated ourselves to writing. And by that, I mean little comedy sketches that we would videotape. And, and I've watched some recently and I can't really say they, that the quality is very high, except that we were just, we, we, we liked being behind the camera, put it that way. We were, we were better at that part of it. So here we are in our early 20s, and we're making our first ever movie. We decided, all right, this is it. We're going we're gonna to be filmmakers. So we wrote a script that we thought we could film for a pretty low budget, and we started shooting this movie. This is in Austin, Texas. And you can see our cinematographer there with us. And it didn't go exactly as planned. I mean, we finished the movie, but then it turned out to be a total flop. That's the short version of the story, sadly. I don't know if you can see uh, my arrow, but the bottom of the screen down there, very sad, one star. And this was really the main review that it ever got in a newspaper, which is kind of sad that that's the only, the only one out there. 
you can go to YouTube later and see the trailer. And I think you'll, I think you'll realize that it's not as bad as that guy said. But the point is that all that, all that time and energy, I, I thought I was just, this is what I was going to do. I was going to be this one kind of writer. And then it's not that I gave up on it by any means at this point, but it was a, it was a eye-opening and not in a good way experience. Like, all right, now I at least have to get a job to start paying back some of the debt from, from making this movie. And I got this job writing history textbooks, which I never meant to do. I never liked them as a kid. I always made fun of how boring they were. And so it's kind of funny that I got a job writing them, but it was also kind of a blessing in disguise because I started, first of all, writing every day and, and practicing writing in a really efficient way because they would give me you know little bits of room to write about different things. But even more than that, I started researching because the main thing I did was research and find stories and, and then they would never let me put them in. You know, anything that I thought was good, like Benedict Arnold, this great trader from the American Revolution, which is the reason that was probably, you know, the first narrative nonfiction book that I wrote because I could never get him into textbooks. They just wouldn't let me. And so after many years of complaining about it and having friends say, why don't you just stop complaining? That would be one thing you could do. And... Uh, just do it, you know, write the kind of books you would like to see as nonfiction, the kind of books you would have wanted to read in middle school. So that's my life now. That's my job. And it, even though I didn't know it was a job, it turned out to be the perfect job for me. And Bomb and Fallout are, are, are companion books, I would say, and, and a perfect example of what I'm trying to do now. So Bomb is a World War II story about the making of the atomic bomb and the spies mainly Russian spies who stole the secrets from American labs during World War II. And that was just a perfect story for what I was trying to do because it's full of science and spying and, and fast paced international action. And it leads directly into fallout. I'll explain what I mean in these next few pictures. All right, so here's, this is back to bomb. Now this is the very end of World War II. Scientists made the world's first atomic bomb. They didn't know if it was going to work. But it was discovered in the 30s that you could split a uranium atom and it would release energy. The nucleus, that is, would release energy as it broke apart. Only enough to make a grain of sand jump like two inches high. But that's one atom. And so they realized, theoretical physicists, that is, that you could make a bomb this way. They, didn't, they weren't interested in making bombs, but it was an idea that you couldn't be contained. And that happened just as World War II broke out. And so that, of course, the world being what it is, launched a race between different powers to see who would make and who could make the bomb first. And especially on, from our point of view, the American point of view, from beating Adolf Hitler to getting the bomb. And that's really the big story in my book, Bomb. And it's about also the spies who stole these secrets. This is the first bomb. It's not a big spoiler to say that it worked. They, they built this tower in New Mexico to test it, and it made one of these massive mushroom clouds, which we associate with that kind of weapon now, although of course no one had ever seen one before. And that leads directly into Fallout because it leads directly into the Cold War. Fallout is a Cold War thriller. The US and the Soviet Union were allies during World War II, but not really friends. We, it was one of those, the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of things. And so we made this bomb, but we didn't tell the Soviets about it until the very end of the war. It turns out they knew because they had spies busy trying to steal the secrets. And after the end of World War II, we, the US and the Soviet Union, were the only two powers, the great two global powers left standing and immediately became rivals. And that was the Cold War, this global rivalry between two powers with very different types of governments and economies and philosophies and different goals in the world. And that lasted. 45 years and incorporated events all over the world. And I didn't want to try to do everything. That's not what I like to do. I like to focus in on one really plot driven set of stories. And this became the, the very opening of Fallout. It was perfect because I, I want to set the tone for a spy thriller. And I love stories that seem unimportant or small, but then lead into something really big. And I also want to see especially on page one, I want a scene that feels like an opening. It feels like you're, you're sitting down to watch a movie and you're, you're hooked right away. And so this is 
the story of this kid named Jimmy Bozart. He was a paper boy in Brooklyn, New York, 13 years old. And the very first thing you see and read in the book is that he's walking up a set of stairs to collect money for his after school paper route. So it's perfectly normal. He goes up to a door, he collects 50 cents from the people who live in this apartment. And there were nickels and dimes, so a little handful of change. And as he turns around to walk down the stairs, he trips and drops the money. And that's where it gets strange because the coins bounce as you'd expect, except one of them breaks open. And this is the actual nickel, it's in the FBI, somewhere in the FBI building now, not too far from, from you guys. And the nickel broke open and as he picks it up, he realizes wedged inside is a little tiny piece of film, which he held up to the light coming in a window and saw just what you see on the screen here. What looks like a code, a coded message, a secret message of some kind. And because this was the Cold War and people were afraid of Russians and Russian spies in America, he thought maybe could that be what this is? Of course, it, it probably isn't, but could it be? And it turned out it was. This was a message from one Russian spy to another in New York City. And just a great opening to the kind of story that I want to tell. Here is the Russian spy. His name was Rudolf Abel. At least that was the, the cover name he used in the States. Um, he looks like a, a movie villain, sort of. But he was actually, a, everyone who knew him said he was a very mild-mannered, very nice guy who pretended to be a retired photographer. And, and he just was into making gadgets in his room. Of course, his neighbors didn't know that. He actually claimed to be an artist and, and said, in my retirement, I'm gonna become a painter. And he took up painting. But secretly in his room, he, was, he had a radio connection with Moscow and he was making spy gadgets. So that's a perfect way to set up the spy versus spy kind of story. But the reason it really counts, the reason it matters is because of the type of weapons that were being made starting in the early Cold War. And that is why I show a picture of the sun because during World War II, scientists realized, okay, we're gonna to try to make this, this weapon by splitting uranium atoms, fission, but it would also be possible theoretically, we don't have time to figure this out right now, but wouldn't it be possible just the way scientists think, wouldn't it be possible to create a fusion bomb too? This is what happens inside of stars. And so it's obviously very, very powerful. This is where the sun gets its light and heat is from in the center, the core of the star, from helium, hydrogen atoms fusing together to form helium and larger atoms. And in that process releasing, that fusion process, releasing energy. And it doesn't seem like something you would wanna put in a bomb and have on earth. But you know, again, scientists, they can't help but think of this thing. And the governments and military of the competing sides in the Cold War said, yeah, yeah, we want, make us that. You know? And both sides thought, uh, well, the other guy is gonna probably do it. So we, we better do it and try to stay ahead. And that led to the development of hydrogen bombs, super bombs, they called them, which is not, an unfitting term. And the Cold War really got serious then because now both sides have the ability to, to wipe each other and everybody off the planet. And then the question becomes, and this really was the question throughout the Cold War. And I remember it, you know, in the 80s, being in high school in the 80s, when it was still going on, we're not really dumb enough to use these weapons, are we? And so I focus on the center of the Cold War when we really, really came close to actually doing that. So this, I, I don't know if you, I wish I could see your reaction because I love really creepy <laughs> stories. So I think this is super creepy. This was on TV. And the US government would set up these mannequins in a house in the desert and then blow it up on TV. And the idea was to scare us, to scare Americans into preparing for World War III which seemed inevitable at the time. So isn't that, isn't that just weird? These guys in these brand new outfits at a dinner party, and then they blow up the house, and then they show the next day, party hasn't worked out that well. And, and then there would be an announcer coming on and saying, well, you don't want this to happen to you, right? So you better prepare today. And that meant building shelters either in your yard or in the bottom of your apartment building, depending on where you live, 
fallout fallout is the key term and it came up so much in my research that it I'm, I'm terrible at coming up with titles but it eventually suggested itself as a title because what people were worried about was that these bombs of course it's is going to do tremendous amount of destruction in select places but the even bigger danger is the fallout because it's going to kick up this radioactive dust and that will take at least two weeks approximately to settle back onto the ground. So you need a shelter until those weeks have passed and you need some form of bathroom and you need water and something to eat and all these things. And they got very elaborate. There are all kinds of handbooks and pamphlets about what to make. I love this cross section because it's just, it's almost, I find it funny, but in, in a very dark, dark way. Because the family always looks so, so happy, like they're having a good time. And the dad is taking a break to light a cigarette, it appears. And uh, they've got the ping pong table and they're ready for a good time while preparing for World War III. Um, but it was, just, it was scary at the same time, which is what it's so, actually, this is just something that you look for if, you're, if you want to tell a story. And I, I know you know this just from, um, think of a movie you love or a book you love. And if there's a really good villain, how important that is to a story. And so as a writer, or if you're, I wish I could ask you this, don't you like, I'm sure some of you have been in plays and theater, don't, isn't it fun to play the villain? Somebody's shaking their head now. Yes, now I, I hope you know what I mean. And so as a writer, it's fun to write the villain and, and you need a very good villain and I can't make anything up. So Nikita Khrushchev from American point of view was a, was a good villain. He was not a monster like, Joseph Stalin, who was the previous ruler of the Soviet Union, but he does look like he just jumped straight out of a James Bond movie, doesn't he? And, and with the bomb blowing up in the background. And so he was the ruler of the premier of the Soviet Union from the mid 50s to early to mid 1960s. And was to us a very scary guy. He was always ranting and raving and he was famously shouting and at one point, uh, banging on a table in the UN with his shoe. And he just seemed a little bit unhinged and certainly unpredictable. It was probably all very calculated from his point of view. But at one point he famously said, we will bury you. That is to us, to the Western democracies, we will bury you. And he claimed that he meant his system, his communist system would eventually win out over our democracies. Uh, but we took it. Americans took it very literally because they're very quickly building all these weapons and pointing them at us. And so it was frightening. This is what my office looks like. I mean, I have all these stories that I want to tell. And that, by the way, the part of the story that I just told is, is really just the setup. It's just like the first three or four chapters as we get into spying and the space race and the arms race and international showdowns. So how do you keep track of all that? And this is my best suggestion. It comes straight from my years of screenwriting, which I always thought of as kind of a failure. It's funny, you can, re you can look at something again and reevaluate it years later. And it wasn't because, yeah, I mean, I mean we made a movie that, that um, didn't succeed and many people thought was terrible. Okay, there's, there's that. But on the other hand, I learned so much that, that I still use now. And one of the great tips that I read when I read books about writing screenplays, which I highly recommend, is to make a storyboard. And that is to take your story, break it down into pieces, just write a little note about each scene that you wanna tell as you're making a story up or researching it and write it on a little card. Of course, this is very old fashioned, but you can do it on a computer if you're more comfortable that way. I love having it be this big, tactile thing that you can move around. And for a story like Fallout, I had five, I'm pointing to my screen like you can see it, but okay, over on this side, my left side of the screen, I have these five different colors and each color just indicates a Khrushchev scene, a John Kennedy scene, who was president of the US in the early 60s, uh, a spy scene, a space race scene, a slash science scene, and an international showdown kind of scene. And, and that really helps me keep track because then I could write that scene on a, the right color and put it under what I think are going to be the different chapters 
which is just these white cards here. And hopefully, can you see how, how that would help you organize a story? It's how every movie and TV series gets made because think of your favorite television series or a novel that you've read recently. It probably had three or four storylines going on at the same time. And, and that just helps create momentum when you're, when you're watching or reading something to have to skip from one interesting story to another. And you just as you're wondering what's about to happen in one, you skip to another. And, and that's just a really good trick to use when you're, when you're telling a story. So I've got, I could tell you many, many more stories in this book. There's so many that I love, but I'm gonna stop for now and come back on screen to see if anyone wants to jump in with a question. So all right, stop share. And I know I can't see you guys, but if anyone has a question, now would be a good time to, to get going with that. Or shall I keep going with what, Leah, can you, um, can you see the, the, the classrooms at all? Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat. We'll give friends a little time for that. Um, but while we're waiting, can I ask a question? Yes, I call on you. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give everyone a little more time to think of some good ones. Um, so you have so many amazing stories in this that just follow and that keep you on the edge of your seat. And it's all about kind of luck and those kind of moments that those yeah. near misses. Um, are there any stories that you just were like, I can't believe this happened and I wish I could have fit it in, um, but it didn't make it in? Because There's so, yes, that's such a good like a question. So many stories and I have all these great things that I did put in, but then stuff that I said, okay, that could be a whole movie. And yet I, I just can't, I can't fit it in, you know, uh, or a whole other book. There was, uh, there was a, we didn't even talk about the Berlin Wall, which is when you learn about the Cold War, that's going to be, that's kind of like the, the symbol of it. It was this literal wall down the middle of between East and West Berlin, this city in Germany. And it was imprisoning the communist side, basically, behind a wall. And people figured out ways to escape. And this should be a whole movie. But there was this guy named Harry Seidel, who was a champion cyclist, a bike racer in East Germany, who turned his talents after the wall went up to being the world's greatest escape tunneler. So that just as a movie pitch, isn't that, isn't that a winner? And I, and I, I, I researched way too much about this guy because I got so into his story. Fascinating how you go from being a bike racer and using some of the same skills, that endurance, the pain tolerance that it takes to be a really good cyclist, um, operating in low oxygen levels as he's digging these tunnels, but it's incredibly dangerous life and death stuff that I ended up using a couple stories of his, but I easily could have just, it could have taken over. It could have, and that's an example of something that happened quite a few times in writing the book. I feel like there's so many different routes you can go, but I love the stories yeah. that you chose. Um, but I think we do have a question from a classroom. So our first question um, is from uh, Miss Youngest's class, um, and they ask, what made you interested in writing stories about history? Yeah, almost accidentally. Although when I go back to think of when I'm, when I was your age, to the students that is, I, I thought I didn't like history, but I think now that I think I did because I did enjoy reading historical adventures, historical novels, you know, exciting stories set in different times and places. And so maybe that was always in there, but I didn't think about writing it as a job until after I got that job writing textbooks. And I kept trying to put stuff in like, okay, I'm gonna write a whole page about Benedict Arnold. And they said, no, just write one word about him. You know, just say he was a traitor, that's it. And I would get so frustrated because now you're taking this great story and making it boring because you're just turning it into a, a bland fact. And and so that's what made me want to write history in a nutshell. I just, I said, that should be a whole book, you know, and if anyone thinks history is boring, I'm going to write a book that's going to absolutely prove that it's not. And that's where it started, just with the, the goal of doing that. 
Love that. I feel like you definitely proved it with your books. So thank you. Oh, so thank much. you. Yeah, you have to prove it. You can't just say it. You have to prove it. And that's the best part of history. You're like, I can't believe you can't even make this up. It's, no. it's true. It happened. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, you ready for another question? Yeah, keep them coming. Sure. Okay. So our next one is from Caitlin and Audrey, Audrey from Dorothy Ham Middle School in Arlington. And they ask, we are curious about how many books you sell each year and which book you wrote that you enjoyed writing the most. Yeah, oh, those are two very different questions. Yeah, I mean, enjoyed writing the most. I'll start with that one because I think it's, it's Fallout is the, most, is the most fresh in my mind, obviously. And so I'm gonna go with that one because I have it right here, my little baby. And two, less than two weeks old, it was just, you can tell I like spy stories. I didn't even scratch the surface of how many spy stories are in this book, but that's what I love more than anything. And so I want I said, I want to write a spy thriller. And then I thought, well, what's the best time for spy thrillers? And that's ne definitely the cold war because it's just that classic spy versus spy era of two powers going head to head and all the gadgets and science involved in it and the very, very high stakes involved. And so that was fun to research. And I, it was, then that just goes to your question, Leah. I mean, that's why I ended up finding way more stories than I needed. Like when we haven't even gotten into the space, we'll think of that being a race to do wonderful science and technology. And that is true. But what it really was in the Cold War was a, a rocket technology race. It was a rocket science race. It was who, and so, it's great that you can put satellites into space and all that, but it was really a means to deliver weapons, or at least not to the scientists, because people don't become scientists to make weapons. They, they want to explore space. But to the governments who are funding it, that's really what they wanted. And they developed these, these rockets that could reach each other's country, you know, one another from over the top of the world. They always plan to go over the top, because if you look at a globe, you'll see how close we are to the Soviet, to the Russians now that way and uh, you know 15 minutes and so that that's what made me want to write the story and why it made it so much fun the story i was reminded of also by your other question was that when kennedy john kennedy and nikita khrushchev met for the first time they kind of sparred a lot of course because they're these rival powers and khrushchev decided to give kennedy a present he sent him a dog and it was a little fluffy white dog named pushinka who was the daughter of one of the Soviet space dogs, one of the dogs the Soviets sent into space and brought back home. And so it was kind of like a poke in the eye saying, you know, this is a cute dog. And oh, by the way, we're winning the space race too. Because they, they had won, put the first satellite into space. They put the first human astronaut into space and all of that. And, and the Kennedy and everyone in, in the American government was so worried about spying at this time that they actually checked the dog to see if it was a spy. They uh, checked it for listening devices and other and hidden cameras or something. So when you have material like that, it's just too much fun to research. And the sales stuff is, it changes every year. And I don't um, know from day to day, but the way you, way you get paid as a writer is very strange. You Every six months, you get a royalty statement from your publisher, whoever published your book, and they'll tell you how many books were sold in that last six month period, exactly to the single digit. And then how much money you made. And, and the royalty is a little different for, it depends on how much money the publisher got from the book. And they sell them at different discounts to different stores or organizations. So it's, it's confusing. I look at it sometimes and I don't even know what I'm looking at, but I look at the numbers and, and it'll sort of determine whether or not you you know, made, made money <laughs> during that time period. Uh, it's very strange. It's a weird way to make a living. <laughs> Definitely worth, but thank you. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> it's worth, I want to keep doing it. So as long as people buy them. Um, I think we have time. We have a bunch more questions. We'll keep going through them. Our next one are from Beth. We got a few questions about your method and your wall. Oh, good. Yeah. So wall. this one, two questions about your storyboard from Beth. How do you keep from writing the whole story on each index card? And how do you decide what to include? So that's the first great, one. Great question. And the second one is, do you organize by chapters 
with the index cards, but you, you had already mentioned that. Yeah, that is true. Yes. Organized by chapters or by the one behind me is a graphic novel. And those are those are episodes. I thought of that. All right, I'm gonna do I'm gonna break it into eight episodes, just like you do, would do for a, a season of a television series. And so, but it's the same idea. And so there's more scenes in that than there would be in a chapter because it's it's sort of equivalent to 40 minutes of you know material in the screenplay, something like that. So yeah, you do need to break it down, but I don't do that right away. I don't think that's super important, actually. I think the important thing is to get the story flow first. And then where chapters begin and end, I'd usually I'll change that right up until the very last time I'm allowed to look at and change my my text. Because I don't think that's super important. I mean, it's nice to have cliffhangers and things like that. But if a story is working, it's working and you you, you want to keep going. So, but the other one was, oh yeah, what do I put on the cards? Very little actually. You could get tempted to put too much, except that when, you, when you're really into the research and, and you've been researching for six months or so, which is about typical of how long it would be before I start making the cards, then you just need a little shorthand. You know, um, the, the, you know, I have a chapter about Yuri Gagarin, the first person in space, the Soviet cosmonaut who, and so I just need to say the, yeah, the Yuri Gagarin flight and all these things come into my mind like that, that I probably want to put in there, but I don't need to put it on the card, the train, what it was like, what it was like to train for space at a time when no one had been to space. They didn't know, they were worried about something they called space madness. Would you go insane in space? Would the zero gravity effect kill you? Things like that, uh, we don't know. We're just gonna try it and see. And so they, they, they came up with, and the Soviets never had the kind of resources that the Americans had in terms of budgets. And they had to, they did things like they would put him in the tallest building in an elevator in the tallest building in Moscow and just let it free fall to see, to see how he would react. And they stopped it, you know, before it hit the bottom, but to try and create that free falling effect. Um, they, they would do things like when they're picking the astro. I love stories like this. How do you, how do you make it? They, they, they put out the call who wants to be, you know, in this new program. And they started with like 2000 fighter pilots and they have to narrow it down. And they would do things like give you a really hard math test while you're wearing headphones and someone is just saying nonsense into your ears. You can imagine how hard that would be to try and recreate. Can you keep your cool under fire? Do you, are you going to be able to think clearly in the midst of chaotic and scary situations? And so all these different things. And I, in my mind, I know I'm going to probably use some of that. I'm probably not going to use all of it. But for the card, I just need that one sentence. And I say, okay, that's probably about, and, and one card, if it's a whole chapter, would be like a thousand words, maybe a little more. But usually each card represents about what I call a scene or just kind of a chunk, which is an average of 400 words, I would say. So think of that as about a page and a half. And you really kind of capture those scenes so well. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. It helps me so much to break it down. Mm -hmm. I get overwhelmed. I mean, and very, the first couple of weeks of writing, I get really intimidated by how much I've taken on with a story like this. This is never going to make sense. <laughs> and that's my biggest uh, fear when I start. I was, is, and so this system was born of that. Like, how am I going to break this down into things that I can manage day by day? And then if you think about it, if you could just write a page a day, that's 300 plus pages in a year. So you can do it. You just have to break it down into little pieces and just work on that one thing and not worry about what you haven't done yet. That's a great way to look at it. Thank you. Um, so our next question is from Karen. Karen asks, you lived through some of the Cold War as a young person. What did you learn in researching this book that was really new information or new point of view that became part of Fallout? That's great. Yeah, I did. And I want, I want to talk about that a little bit, just what, what that was like. But I learned so much because, because I knew it was mainly about the part I lived through, which was the 80s through the fall of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, which was scary enough for me. But 
the, at the heart of this story is the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I think is the most, well, it's not my, this is not my theory, but most historians would agree is the most dangerous few days in the history of the world because we came so close to using, to fighting, and things became so close to just getting out of control. And sometimes wars often start that way, actually, where uh, people are armed and ready and no one really wants to fight, but no one wants to back down. And next thing you know, World War One is happening, you know, that sort of thing. Except this time it's not gonna last four years. So yeah, that's, I was just surprised by how dangerous it was and, and how frightening it was. And, and it's just also so different, like during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's just something you just wouldn't know unless you researched it. Especially you guys today, you're just used to being able to get news 24 hours a day, whether you want it or not, it's all, it's all around. And, and during this crisis where people were very much scared that they might not wake up the next day or wake up in a very different world, there was no TV. There was, it was not on overnight. You know? There was no CNN or no, no cable at all. And it was very hard to get news. And you see the classic pictures from those times of people gathered around TV sets in a store, you know, because that's how there was no internet. There's no way to get instant news. So if you're walking by a store and you see the president speaking, you know, you would stop and try to get a snippet of news that way. So yeah, that was all surprising to me because it, was, it wasn't something that I experienced firsthand. What I experienced was more like, being a cynical teenager and thinking, what are adults thinking? This is crazy. We have 60,000 of these bombs now between us, between these two powers. And then they would say, well, don't worry, we're not going to use it because we, we would, if they would, then they would use it against us and we'd all die. So no one's going to be dumb enough to start this kind of war. And I just wasn't satisfied with that explanation because things could so easily go wrong. And it made me kind of cynical as, as a teen thinking, Wow, there's got to be a better way to uh, to to run the world than this. That was my experience, my main memory from high school. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> um, our next question is a fun one from Anna um, from Dorothy Ham Middle School. Um, would you like to know if you could collaborate with any author? Who would it be? Wow. <laughs> Collaborate. I mean, I love, I love comics. We haven't even gotten into graphic novels and comics yet. I'm doing a graphic novel of Bomb, and that is to say, I'm writing it, and um, someone else is. So I'm going to think it's going to be like that kind of collaboration where, where I could just pick out some of the greatest artists and um, of graphic novels and and collaborate on with, with them, where I would do the text and someone else would do the art because I love doing comics but I realized that pretty early on that I wasn't going to be a professional artist you know it was just it was something that yeah you could do I could do for fun but that it would be better to collaborate with a really good artist so I want I would love to do more of that oh, I'd love to see a graph can't wait to see a graphic novel Bob. oh good yeah it's gonna look amazing and now saying that too it, it looks, uh, the artist who did that is his name, Nick Bertozzi, and he is well known as an artist in the graphic novel world, and he's done a lot of good historical graphic novels too. So he has just a really good touch of historical scenes and the drama of the characters, and it's just, it looks even better than, it looked cool in my mind, but it looks even better when I've seen the pages of it. It's amazing. Well, I think we have time for a few more questions. Yeah, good. good. <laughs> so our next one's from uh, Lulu from Dorothy Ham. Wants to know if you have ever been interested in writing books other than history books. Yes, and mostly that's what I was interested in. Throughout most of my life, I thought of myself as really a creative writer and hopefully funny writer and not a serious history guy, but... So, those, so I still have a lot of those ideas, even though it turns out I love doing these books and I get to put in a lot of creativity and sense of humor into them. Uh, but yeah, fiction and comics, I, I definitely, I have ideas for novels that have nothing to do with history that I think are just kind of funny 
comedy adventure type stories, which is really the main thing that I always love to read as, as a young reader. So the short answer is yes, definitely. Hopefully I'll do more of that. Can't wait to see it. Um, our next one's from Ian from Dorothyham. And Ian wants to know, how long did it take to write Fallout? Probably about a year and a half. I mean, to really, really, like the, the beginning of the process to, to my end of the process was like a year and a half, which is pretty, that's, that's as good as I can do in terms of a tight timeline. And that is break, kind of breaks down into half research and half writing. And then the writing is half first draft and half revision. And, and then there's like another year of, of copy editing, which means checking for silly things, typos, but also double checking the facts and making sure all that is correct, finding all the pictures. I don't count that in my year and a half because the year and a half that I, is just intense, me in this room, and then working with my editor, who's just like a teacher because I'll write something that I think is really good. And then it'll come back with a, a C on it, you know, cause she'll say, well, this is, this wasn't clear and this was, but it's not really a great, I think of it that way because it comes back and it has so many comments on it. And if I could see you guys right now, here's the number one thing I want to know. Did you ever get something back from your teacher that had comments on it? And then said, did you ever say, Hey, this is great. Now I get to do it again. Is anybody raising their hand? That's my question. I can't see you, but I'm going to guess no. But maybe there is somebody. You see somebody? There's always, yeah. Uh, that's that's what it's like to be a writer. You do this first draft that you think is really good and you think you're, you know you're not really done, but you sort of think you put all your effort into it. And then you find out all the things that still need to be better about it. And what I would say is that's actually a lot easier that you shouldn't dread the revisions part because it's actually so much easier. And every writer will secretly admit, at least secretly, they'll admit that their first drafts are not very good. And so that last like three or four months, most of it, that first year is just almost entirely alone. And then those last three or four months are back and forth with my editor. We might go maybe three or four times over the whole thing and the edits will get smaller and, and, and more just really specific each time so that the last couple rounds are really easy to to fix. The first round is, is harder. So that stretches out over, I would say usually a year and a half to two years per book. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. So for our last question, it's still um, is a good, I bet a lot of friends out there are having to write a lot of research papers and having to do a lot of uh, in, interesting fact checking. So our last question is from Mrs. Donnelly from Dorothy Ham, And um, Mrs. Donnelly asks, can you share any tips for researching? Because it can be overwhelming to figure out what to read as research. Yes, and I, only, I always say this, and not just when librarians are listening or teachers, but I always start with a, with a library and a book before I look at the internet, because the internet is to me overwhelming. And if I want to learn about, say, the making of the atomic bomb, it's so much more useful to me to find a book about it for two reasons. One, because then I could read, especially focus on the parts I'm, I'm really interested in and get a good background information on it. And then the other thing, which you really should do, um, is to look at the source notes. I know it doesn't seem exciting, but if you get a good book from the library, those source notes are going to put you way ahead of the game because then you know, it's as if that person has done all that research for you. You can say, well, I'm really interested in this part of the story. And then you could very easily flip to the back of the book and find out where the author got their information for that part of the story. And then you're gonna find a source that's really gonna impress your teachers. And how do you find that? Well, then you go to the computer with that source note and put in the title and it might come up as a, a book you can find online or in the library or an article you can, so much is available now online or a video you can see on YouTube, the kind of stuff you never would have found with a general search that would have just given you Wikipedia and other, and other things like that. And so that's my best advice is start with a book to, to not just get the background information, but to use the notes, the source notes in the back to help you find the stuff that wouldn't come up 
in an obvious search and probably wouldn't be in, in your school library, but it's still easily accessible these days. Thank you so much for those great tips. It's like oh, a scavenger hunt. Yeah, it, think of it that way. <laughs> scavenger hunt, nerdy detective work, whatever it is. And it really is detective work. You're following one clue to another clue. And eventually you can um, even reach out to people who were who either wrote about the subject or were a part of per certain parts of history. And once you've done your homework, and, and then you can really find out interesting things. Just yeah, think of it as detective work. That's a really smart way to think of it. Well, sadly, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, thank everybody. Thank you so much, yes, everyone, for those you, questions. Everyone. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but they've all been such great contributions. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, let's give a big thanks to Steve for joining us this uh, today and sharing his words and insights. And of course, um, everyone for joining us. Don't forget, you can still click on that link um, that we'll drop again in the chat box to grab your own copies of Fallout. And if you haven't, of course, check out Baum and his other amazing books. Um, you can find out more about our uh, other upcoming events on our website for updated listings. And you can also follow us on our kids and teen department on social media. Um, and our ha handle will be posted in the chat as well. So you can also watch our past events like this one on our YouTube page on Politics and Prose. So thanks again, everyone. I hope you keep reading widely and expanding your world, exploring new ones and diving into